thank you so much uh, kind persons for this welcome and uh, i would just like to start diabetes uh, group i have three disclaimers so number one whenever i see a flyer come by with mine and suresh's photograph i always am worried it's going to be a debate and whenever it's not a debate also somehow we manage to convert it so number two is my able friend has nicely said the segue talking about how we should be glucose we should be patient centric and not glucose centric but unfortunately he was speaking about the sulfonylurea so he went back to say it works by lowering glucose so we now need to think beyond that so i really think my topic is wonderful is we are going to speak about glucose management in early diabetes and i apologize i stand between you and lunch so i'll try to keep it brief but let's make some solid points is i know this audience is uh, very smart and robust and you all understand what a dpp4 inhibitor does so i need to teach you beyond what you don't know so that's where i will try to make a few points today so the burden of diabetes in india why are we here even discussing cuz as sir said good to hear something nice about a sulfonylurea this comment boiled it down to that in india we need to think of affordable medication so fortunately linagliptin the molecule that was studied in carolina yes it's expensive but we have newer inexpensive molecules and better molecules available to us so we will have a word on carolina also at the very end so the burden of diabetes in india has been growing we know that the prevalence which was 8.9% which translates to 74 million and simply put we have one out of 12 indians can have diabetes and we know from a study done recently that one in 3 indians are overweight or obese which very well means they could have insulin resistance and pre diabetes this number was one in 5 at the last survey it's now one in 3 have pre diabetes overweight and obesity so these are important things to keep in mind why is we know we rapidly progress from pre diabetes to diabetes in indians and if some of you attended the morning sessions what is the soil in us that is doing this is it more insulin resistance or a lack of insulin secretion so the answer is the latter that we don't have enough insulin so how well will agents like sulfonylureas work so we need to be cognizant and be able to identify our patients sir with insulin resistance versus insulin lack and therefore we can better treat them so india has a dual problem now that we had a high burden but we have a high future burden of diabetes because of this increase in pre diabetes obesity and overweight also we know very well that diabetes control is far from being optimal only one out of 3 achieve an hba1c goal of less than 7% in spite of multiple prescriptions mind you we write the prescription whether the patient takes it or not there is hence no significant improvement in achieving hba1c what do we need to change so the first answer would be ourselves we need to do a better job of identifying what is the metabolic defect in our patients and then understand the way which molecules work and how we can better use them when should we act to arrest this rapid translation from pre diabetes to diabetes to uncontrolled diabetes should we be conventional in our approach what sure showed you metformin alone and then add a sulfonylurea or do we need to be aggressive right from the start using multiple drugs at the outset and at what age be one c and how can we do this without causing hypoglycemia or any other side effects of therapy so here what i have shown you is from dr de franzo study where in subjects in the san antonio metabolism study were looked at and divided into tertiles and they very closely mimic the indian population into normal glucose tolerance igt and type 2 diabetes and what we found is that more than 80% of beta cell function was already lost so you can see here is your normal patients by the time they even have igt they have lost most of their beta cell function it's therefore crucial that we initiate treatment and probably a multifactorial approach very early in disease progression we have to focus on salvaging the beta cell function and this is a slide that suresh already showed you that the ada as well as the rssdi now talk about let's boil it down to how long has the patient has had diabetes 
what is the age thereby what is the life expectancy are there any significant comorbidities or pre-existing micro or macrovascular complications and this will certainly help you to guide your therapy treatment strategy should be aimed not simply at glucose lowering but also improving quality of life and preventing the micro and the macrovascular complications so the legacy effect so this is where it all boils down to if we can treat early on and we can treat to bring down the hba1c below 7% we will prevent what is known as the legacy effect that causes all these complications now what does this mean so this is when the patient is diagnosed with diabetes and you bring down the hba1c early on and keep it down versus the sequential approach wherein we check the hemoglobin a1c every 12 weeks and escalate therapy leaving this huge window wherein the patient has poorly controlled diabetes in the background what is happening is this glucose is causing all the microvascular damage and this is what is known as the legacy effect and we have learned our lesson sorely from the uk pds study that this approach does not work we also know from the type 1 diabetes data from the dcct trial in the edic follow up that similarly we need to treat much better and aggressive control will result in better control however when the accord trial came along we were a bit concerned because of the increased rate of mortality what we now know is that increase was non significant the study had to be stopped prematurely because there was this 22% increase risk but whoever did not achieve the hba1c goal that is the one who correlated with an increased mortality so if you had good glycemic control you did not have this increased mortality risk so i'm going to skip one or two slides so we can move along and try to understand why does this work these are the challenges to overcome hypoglycemia weight gain cv risk and any other related adverse events and because of a country like india i added this fourth point of cost which is something which we must always keep in mind and hence as clinicians we need to understand better which second line options can have a good balance and a good benefit to risk ratio so what i always ask my students to break it down to is when the patient comes to see you let's individualize hba1c target it is 6.5% for a very young new onset diabetic versus 8% for a older gentleman in their 70s or 80s with underlying renal failure now look at their profile do they have a fasting hyperglycemia do they have a postprandial hyperglycemia or do they have a day long hyperglycemia when you have this and you understand how your agents work you will be in a better position to select which agent to give so for example the sulfonylureas as we know they can bring down hba1c and they work mainly on postprandial sugar but by virtue of a very robust postprandial glucose lowering they also reduce your fasting blood sugar let's take uh, dpp4 inhibitors we know that they are not very costly they have intermediate efficacy now as the name suggests dpp4 works on the incretin pathway so again they should work in response to an oral glucose load correct so they should work on the postprandial glycemia but we also know again by virtue of their other benefits at the level of the liver at the level of the skeletal muscle they are also able to work and reduce your fasting glycemia by a small amount by about 20 30 mg per deciliter so if i had a patient who came with a postprandial hyperglycemia on metformin maybe before a sulfonylurea in an indian scenario i might initiate a dpp4 so these are important things to keep in mind you can see that they have a low hypoglycemia risk they are neutral the side effects are very rare and the cv effects we know that we don't have an increased signal in the carolina trial which was designed to look at cv outcomes of linagliptin versus glimepiride so as dr suresh mentioned to you that there was an early increased glycemic benefit seen with sulfonylurea are we surprised no we already know it's a more potent agent what we have to see is that there was less hypoglycemia in the linagliptin arm and at the end of the study period the cardiovascular outcome was similar 11.8% versus 12% in both the arms now what this tells you is that with less hypoglycemia you could have a better cv safety profile with a dpp4 inhibitor and that is what is important in a patient centric approach so therefore we have to think of safe agents 
newer agents that are available to us now the second part of the story how soon do you initiate one drug two drugs at outset so this is where i'm going to show you metformin plus a dpp4 inhibitor early on will act on multiple pathophysiological defects from dr defronzo's ominous octet we have already learned that by the time you diagnose the patient with type 2 diabetes it is not simply an insulin problem it's a fat cell problem it's a liver problem it's a kidney problem in fact it's even a brain problem so you need to at least be working on one or two prongs of this whole ominous octet in order to have now we move on simply from glucose control let's add in a term sustained glycemic effect so therefore long term glucose control so here's an agent that needs to work at several pathways and in order to explain this of course we know about the ukpds the adopt and the accord i'm going to show you a newer trial which i really find fascinating this is the verify trial so we have our own dpp4 inhibitor which is not very expensive and that's the only reason for picking this that the wilda gliptin efficacy in combination with metformin for early onset or early treatment of type 2 diabetes verifying the future so this is probably the first trial of its kind to investigate the long term clinical benefits of patients who have an hba1c of 6.5 to 7.5% looking at two drugs versus standard of care metformin monotherapy so this is fascinating this is what we need to understand for our patients how can we fill in the gap so in the verified trial the patients who were enrolled had this hba1c the mean baseline hba1c was 6.5% the questions that they sought to answer is what is the time to primary failure meaning when does the hb1c start going higher and what is the time to secondary failure and is initiating with dual agent the thing that we should all be doing versus starting with a single drug and i think this is a problem we face on a daily basis when we have our patients who come to you for the first time with an hb1c of 7% so let's look at the study design what they did this it's a multinational multi ethnic five year study patients who were in the age group of 18 to 70 bmi between 22 to 40 and this age bmi as mentioned they were looked at what they did is in the first period so there was a run in period where everybody was put on metformin to make sure they're on standard doses of metformin then in the first run in period the the, the treatment group was given wilda gliptin 50 mg twice a day continuing metformin 1000 mg and the other group was given placebo twice a day continuing metformin 2000 mg a day and the hba1c at the end of 13 weeks if it was going higher than 7% you would call it rescue treatment can be added which was not needed which i'll show you in the results and then there was a period 2 of another 13 weeks and in the follow up period it was left to invest the physician discretion that they could add a basal insulin if the hba1c started escaping and we studied them all the way up to 5 years to see what happens so are you guys ready for the results so primary as i said time to treatment failure secondary time to treatment failure and also safety and tolerability as a side corollary they also looked at cv events even though it was not powered for cv outcome so this is simply put the study design uh, 34 countries and remember we have 163 indian patients and about 13 indian centers so we have some good indian data to look The baseline characteristics showed that the HbA1c was 6.7, 50% or greater for women in both the arms. Duration of diabetes I mentioned to you less than three years, so this was a new onset diabetic patients. BMI was about 31, and the patients had a normal GFR uh, were 43%. So there were some patients also with a low GFR. So what do we find in the efficacy? Time to initial treatment failure. So in the first three months. there was a 49% relative risk reduction in the combination therapy versus using metformin monotherapy so this is fantastic with a good hazard ratio of 0.51 the p value being less than 0.001 so this is your time to initial treatment failure what i'm going to show you in the next slide this is the median time to initial treatment failure now what that means is that the patients in the combination therapy did not fail beyond the study duration of 60 months even at 61.9 months so therefore early combination with wildagliptin and metformin in patients who had an hba1c between 6.5 to 7.5 
within less than three years of diagnosis, was successful in maintaining this glycemic efficacy. So this is fantastic. Therefore, now when we look at secondary failure, secondary failure is again going to show you additional benefit is we have the fallover from the primary benefit. So more than two agents will provide you a 49% risk reduction. Now, some of you might have read about the GREAT trial, and maybe in the Q&A session, we can address that. In the time to secondary treatment failure also, combination therapy did better than initial monotherapy, 26%. Now, let's see what's happening to these patients during the study period. Are we reaching the HbA1c goal? Because I showed you at the outset how we don't. Higher HbA1c goal, more than 60% was seen in the combination therapy at the end of five years, and even more than 40% when they were looked in the longer duration. So this shows you that you do better when you are trying to work on multiple pathophysiological defects. So what about the remaining? We have to look at the cardiovascular benefits and other benefits. You can see change in body weight from baseline. We don't expect a robust weight loss. There was no weight gain is how I would look at it in the DPP4 arm. Uh, similarly, in the metformin arm, Safety, we did not see any significant hypoglycemia, no serious adverse events, as you can see across the board versus the placebo, the side effects remain the same. Effect on cardiovascular events. So even though this trial is not powered to look at CV risk reduction, early, non, early numerical reduction in CV events, though non-significant, was seen again in the dual combination therapy versus the monotherapy. So maybe there is a good CV, it is their CV safe and we may have that CV benefit to offer. Did this make an impact on any of the recommendation guidelines? We already know from the latest RSSDI guidelines, the ADA 2023, in fact, way back as the ADA 2020 and the RSSDI 2020, we started moving on to a patient-centric approach. We moved away from a glucocentric approach, wherein the guidelines now speak about assessing the patients for underlying ASCVD risk and renal risk protection, and then we make a choice of the agent and not simply on the HBA. That should be my last slide. So to conclude, two-thirds of our Indian diabetic patients do not achieve HbA1c target. We have a huge amount of patients who are facing a future burden of diabetes. Understanding your molecules, understanding multiple pathophysiological defects of diabetes, and selecting the right agent is the way forward. I thank you very much for your